Kuyu um, uh, Association, also from the Portuguese Astronomical Society, you already uh, know her for, for uh, presentations during the conference. So without further ado, let's hear uh, Ellen. Ellen, please. Help. 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 I think I better speak very quickly so we can get some information in in a very short period of time. I think some of you know my long-standing love affair with this country in its good and bad phases, and it's always wonderful to be in Greece, wonderful to be in this school, and it's always wonderful to be able to see that one never comes to Greece without change and unexpectedness happening. My morning began with lightning, thunder, storms, road floods, a manic taxi driver who managed to break three red lights, um, speak on his mobile phone while texting on the other phone, got me here in one place, and of course we've had these wonderful power cuts. And maybe this is exactly the point where I want to start what I, what I want to say to you today. You want to talk about open to what? You've had a wonderful couple of days here, sharing examples, sharing ideas, looking at the practical applications of open use of technology in classrooms and open classes. All of us love open. It's a great place to be. And when we look at this, we begin to realize that there are a number of questions, however, we have to ask. We are living at a time of profound change, and I want to talk about three Cs. I want to talk about change, I want to talk about crisis, and I want to talk about context. Because we can all leave this conference, or many other conferences like this, thinking, this is a great idea, and then we go home and go to our schools or go to our communities when we are met with a wall of incomprehension or silence or even opposition. I remember colleagues of mine going away in a very important conference <coughs> in Ireland and coming back and the first thing being asked of them, did you have a nice holiday? So when we go away to actually learn and think it's considered a luxury and this is different from the world, nor at times attractive. What will an uncertain future bring to us? There was a time, certainly for our parents' generation and for some of us in the room as I look around, for those of us when we were younger, when it seemed that this was a linear world, we would progress in stages to a very positive outcome, a legacy of the 19th century, the age of positivism. Now we are living in a time of chaos where this is not at all clear, either what is happening or what the future will bring. Where does the digital end? And this has become a really important point, as voices are being raised at the moment about the impact and indeed the threat of artificial intelligence. We are beginning to see moves into areas of technology that is responsive, that knows us, that knows us very well, and we don't know it, and yet we created this. And then to avoid some kind of Faustian problem, we need to move very rapidly to understand where the digital ends and more importantly, and this is something I think we have neglected. Where does the human begin? And this question of human values and human existence and human priorities is not secondary to the use of technology or its application. It goes right to the core of learning. What are we learning? And I think this is an important question. Because the what we learned was traditionally based on what would happen to us at the end. Our children, our students, our pupils, we ourselves would get jobs. In other words, there was an end point, and now there is none. How are we learning it, which is usually the meat and potatoes of the technology we talk about in learning? How do we learn? Traditional ways of memorization, rote learning, repetition are considered passé, although they still have a role. But now, how do we learn? Do we learn through accessing YouTube, Facebook, which seems to be a wonderful one, anything else? But more importantly, that third question, why are we learning it? And this brings me to the question I start with and end with, what do we value? I think, therefore, that when we approach openness, we need to look at a few things. Understanding this concept of open is now critical for future educational policy. Some countries, not all, and in Europe we still have national governments primarily responsible for educational policy, say that open is good. They value this and they want to go down this road. However, when we probe it a bit more deeply, we find there are points of, shall we say, lack of clarity. Because open itself is deeply contradictory. 
Certainly in the English language, while open does mean, from the active point of view, we are looking outward, we are open to what we learn, open also means that you are vulnerable, that you are capable of being probed and analyzed and not necessarily with your will. Openness, therefore, is an ambiguous one. It is a hedra, many, many headed. And this open exists in a changing and in a conflicted world. When we look at this and we begin to tease and unpack, therefore, notions and concepts of openness, we need to do that in a sense of why we're doing it. Will this be a qualitative improvement on what has gone before? Will this advance that which we wish, wish to advance, whether it's subject-specific expertise or whether it's the development of the whole person able to cope with a world we did not create in which we're increasingly powerless to shape? And this is my key point. It is not enough to be passive observers of what is going on. We must engage with it. So there are two bookmarks to frame this set of questions around openness I want to suggest with you. One began at the begin one, one came through at the beginning of the week, and this was the OECD report, which you're probably aware of, which received quite a bit of attention in the media. And there were various interpretations of this report. I came across this in Ireland, of course, it was headline news where people said, ah, to thank heavens we never invested in technology in Ireland. Thank heavens we're the third lowest user of this in Europe because now it doesn't work. Many people came out of the caves and began to say this proves that technology is bad and the OECD report did nothing of the sort. What is interesting is that some of its findings have been seized on by vested interests as you know, the work was largely connected with PISA results. The language going through some of the responses here talk about results and outcomes and why can't we be like South Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong? Why can't we be? Well, the reason is we're not. And second of all, many people there are not like that either. This is a very selective skimming of selective uh, uh, findings and it confuses throughout technology and the use of techne, which comes from art, and computers, which are passe by their nature. Integrating technology with education is the imperative. I'm very proud of the fact that at a press conference on Thursday, our own Secretary General of the Department of Education and Science in Ireland, Mr. Ofolu, pointed out that the report and the misinterpretations of the report would have no effect whatsoever on Irish government policy of producing a digital transformation in schools that led to enhanced and deepened learning. I think this is very positive. But what is critical here is that technology in education is not something new. We have had this issue since we extended in the 16th century literacy out from 8% of the population to, gee, 25% through the invention of the printing press. And later on, technology is intimately connected with access. The question is therefore about the role of the school of the 21st century in, address in addressing systemic challenge. The second bookmark for this extraordinary week, with the lightning and the rain, and maybe Zeus is not particularly happy with the election result yesterday, I don't know, is this. We are living through a profound shock to our European system because of the not unanticipated issue of refugee crisis. And these are some of the images that are coming through. There are images, other ones that you know of, our press, our media is full of this. And this reality is not a temporary blip that will somehow be solved. It goes to the core of European responses to what we should have seen coming. If you create chaos, be not surprised when chaos arrives in your doorstep and the results of it. And what is happening is we complain about 300,000 refugees possibly coming. We talk about this, and we confuse it, by the way, with migrants. A migrant crisis, it's not. This is about refugees. Migrants are another day's work, and that's also an internal issue, is that we talk about this neglecting the fact that Turkey already has 2 million refugees. Lebanon, God help us, has 1 million. Jordan, 800,000. People who've lived with this for years sit back bemused as Europe goes through agonies over how do we respond to human rights challenges. This world of Europe that vaunted its open borders 
its open movement of labor faced with the first challenge collapses under the weight of its own insularity. And I think this is profoundly regrettable. So let's look at some of the points, therefore, that are important. Let's look at change. The change that's happening, if we bookmark between these two pillars of the refugee crisis and this OECD report and everything, these could be two pillars of Hercules guiding us out to the Atlantic and a greater discovery, or they could be the pillars of Scylla and Charybdis, okay, ready to clash us and crush us. But here are some of the dimensions. Change, we're living through, it's constant and often unexpected. If we had produced good research skills in ourselves and in our pupils, maybe we wouldn't find it so unexpected. But when you live in a linear world and suddenly it becomes diffuse, this change is very important. Also, when we look at the mobility we've produced, Erasmus, above all, one of the most successful European programs allowing this mobility, this was a foretaste of the fact that mobility and migration that comes with it is now the norm. It is not something we can put back in Pandora's box. And this raises critical questions for our pupils and for our schools around identity and perceived threats of difference. And I think this is something that is increasing and will not go away. We live in a time of globalized economics. We cannot find national borders any longer to contain this. We cannot even find international or regional borders. We have other dimensions of this change. The end of welfare. The end of welfare is a right, and this transformation is into some kind of privilege doled out to a tiny minority. A radical reversal of what 150 years of struggle led to. We have the demographic time bombs, which is one of the reasons Germany could turn around and say 600,000 refugees, wonderful. When the average age in Germany, the average family size is down to 1.2, reproductive rate, people are aging, in the state of Thuringia, I mentioned the average age of teachers. The average age is now 52. I have nothing against 52-year-old people. Some of my best friends are 52. But what it is saying is that we have within our system the seeds of major difficulties. And therefore, we have knowledge deficits. We have innovation deficits. Where is the European Silicon Valley? And we have democratic deficits. The crisis we're living through, and have been living through openly since 2008, I'm aware of where I'm speaking and the ramifications of that crisis in Greece that still are with us, but the first country to go into it was Ireland, indicate that we are going through a seismic shift in human relationships, where competitive pressures have increased, new forms of work organization are doing away with our assumed ideas of the job, the new diversities among us are really critically important, we now have most countries living under the reality of permanent debt. It will be there for decades to come, and the response is to dismantle the public sphere. The structural imbalances, particularly within the European Union, are severe and are, according to the Commission itself, accelerating. We have a union adrift. And yet another image of the drifting that we have, while this is about the refugees, might be about the collective wisdom of our political leadership as well. So this brings us back, therefore, to how do we shape our understanding and our engagement with openness in our classrooms and in our schools. I think we need to revisit the idea of purpose of learning in this age of uncertainty. I need, we think we need to examine the fact that linear models of learning no longer exist or they are transforming profoundly. We do live in an era of cognitive dissonance what is needed by our pupils and by our students is simply not being provided. And if it's not, they go elsewhere. We have strong evidence that for many young people, in this world of change, there is an increase in alienation and anomie. What is the point? Where is it taking us? During the ODS project in which I and our agency have been working, we were able to access a lot of wonderful information and research one of the points that struck me during one seminar was that in the Netherlands, 36% of teachers' time is taken up controlling disruptive behavior. And this is really interesting in terms of what this is saying. The labor market itself, to which most of our pupils aspire at one point or another, is in flux. The loss of autonomy as jobs move, move with stunning regularity from place to place. What this means is that adaptability and innovation 
are not exceptions anymore. They, like migration, are the norm. And in this new globalized paradigm, we have fractured communities. Fractured communities trying to find their way to survive from day to day, something that would have been inconceivable in our discourse 10 years ago. And yet it's within that that we as educators are called to respond and engage. And finally, if I just mention before I move on, the elephants in the room that what we're really coming to talk about is nature's of power and ownership. Who runs this process? So I want to conclude by looking at some of the points, therefore, around the open classroom, the open classroom initiative. This is not going to go away. This is going to be a critical issue for us in the future. You yourselves as practitioners have seen how possible this is. But now we need to make it not just possible, but desirable and achievable. I would say, first of all, in terms of the internal sense, sense that the role of the teacher is absolutely critical. Nothing is going to work in the Open Classroom Initiative. No technology can replace, no technology, the gifted voice of the inspector. The impact of examination and assessment systems is itself critical, but this brings us back to how we can include an open dimension in a world that doesn't accept it. In Ireland, for example, we've had our teachers on strike over the last year against any form of portfolio assessment and moving away from written examinations. All the paper you could possibly want, Rosa. And finally, technology without meaning is what happens in this context. External focus for the open classroom. We all need to understand that our schools are but a subsystem of a bigger educational polity that itself includes laws and policies and strategies. The domination in most countries of curriculum is critical, and we need to acknowledge that, and that there are many on the educational system contradictory demands and expectations. I've already talked about the intrinsic relationship to the labor market. But what we are talking about in many schools and in many countries is a question of legacies of segregation, hierarchy, and the obsession with results by parents, pupils, and teachers alike. Tony Bates, who's written something about this in 2011, made a very interesting thing that open education resources do have an important role to play in online education, but they need to be properly designed and developed within a broader learning context. This context includes critical activities needed to support learning, such as opportunities for student instructor and peer interaction, and, and I think this is important, within a culture of sharing, such as consortium of equal partners and other frameworks that provide a context that encourages and supports sharing. My lord, in the European Union of neoliberal debt reduction and deconstruction of the public, and here comes a very strong voice from our sector and uses the word sharing. Finally, dimensions of openness. We have opportunities. We have opportunities using an open approach to develop networked innovation, as many of you yourselves in your examples have indicated. We have a way to create new and dynamic pedagogies. We have a way to accelerate learning and multiply it in a dramatic and user-friendly way. There are risks. There are risks that the open approach we can advocate is confined to a few, those that have get more and those that haven't get less. And this access issue is critically important. We need not to avoid critical analysis. There are many myths around um, openness, as I talk about, and there are unquestioned assumptions very often about the neutrality of materials. Mythologies, open learning, Open classrooms, open educational resources are not a panacea. And finally, how open is open? I can ask Mr. Snowden about that. Final point that I want to emphasize, because it reflects my own background and my own work before I came to education, which is around marginalization, is this question of recognizing difference is no longer an optional extra. Those who were consigned to the asylums and the sheltered homes and the segregated institutions for the last centuries are now rightly taking their place in an included society, but this is not without problems. We need in our systems to accept difference, respond to difference, see the difference as permanent. To have a major candidate for president in the United States and the Republican Party saying that Muslims were not fit to be president I think shows you the shocking level of ignorance when people say, we will give rights to those that look, act, and think just like us, but nobody else. 
This managing diversity therefore becomes a critical issue to be authentically open, to create shared meaning in these uncertain times, to provide support and inclusion and not throw people into some technological maze, valuing difference as a critical advantage, to maintain that creative evidence that demonstrates our own research capacity. Openness means nothing if we don't break out of the boundaries that we may unconsciously already have. Learning is and should be emancipatory, not simply a supply chain. And we must shape futures and not react to them. So here is the point of critical reflection to which I'd like to hand over to our panel, to our own discussion. And this is my own personal feel is that whatever technology we have, and we should have more and better technologies enabling us to go for imperatives of excellence, nothing less. The paramount role of the teacher, this needs an injection of life, blood, blood enthusiasm, passion, and internationalization. Engaging with the real world we live in now and not yesterday's, few of us are aware of how terminal yesterday's world is. We cannot see how it's ended because it's ended with a crash and a bang and a power cut. We need to develop sustainable research capacity in schools and not just secondary schools or universities, but as I get to this stage in my life, I more and more understand and see the critical importance of early childhood education. This area above all is the one area where technology can revolutionize not just the children involved, but those who work with them and their families. And this brings us to maybe a renewed sense of citizenship and responsibility. My last point is, there's no point having open classrooms and closed minds. And that perhaps is a good point to finish on. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Alan is now joining us in the panel. And um, to start our discussion, um, I would uh, basically uh, retrieve this last uh, um, message from uh, from Alan. So, open to what? What does it mean uh, being open? Open is not just uh, um, introducing technology. We can uh, technology is a tool. We can use technology in a good way, but also in a bad way. Uh, and openness e e implies a different state of mind, e implies a, dif a, a change in our culture, an or organizational culture, and our educational culture, in the way that we, uh, uh, that we understand our practice, and also in the way that our institutions are organized, and everything that uh, contributes to the education process is um, um, designed and is organized as well. Uh, in, in this sense, I would now uh, invite to um, to comment on uh, on this um, on this uh, present on this address by by Alan, all the members of the panel, and also uh, um, would add something that was collected from uh, from you actually uh, um, by, uh, through the social media activity, also by uh, individual contacts with, with uh, you during the. The, um, the days of the conference, we tried to uh, um, collect what would be the main uh, issues, the main topics that you would like to, to, be, to be seen discussed by us. And probably one of the most important uh, that summarizes a little bit uh, your concerns is how everything that is being dis debated here actually is transferred to your own uh, workplace. So how uh, does research and this reflection can uh, um, be used can be useful and be used and be transferred to uh, um, actually to your own uh, work context and how can it help you to uh, innovate uh, in your your practices. So I would like to hand over to uh, Sophocles now to, st to start the, the debate. Um, I would like first, as Alan mentioned, uh, the uh, OECD report uh, and uh, the reaction in uh, Ireland um, for the moment, we don't have government to react officially. So uh, what I can say is uh, uh, in a specific uh, table of the report, it's the first time that uh, Greece scores uh, very high. Usually, we were 
uh, below the uh, the middle of the of the of the ranking, uh, especially in uh, school autonomy, we were last in the previous reports. But this time, uh, when uh, students are asked how long time they are spending online during the, the school day, we are at the third place with uh, 45 minutes. Uh, what I can say from uh, my experience working uh, with Greek schools for 17 uh, years now is that uh, this is not correct. Uh, probably this 45 minutes is connected with uh, uh, one uh, teaching hour in informatics, probably. So maybe people, they are considering that uh, when they are spending one hour in informatics lesson, this can be uh, online. But uh, I think this brings us to the issue about the context. And uh, for all of us who are working in the framework of projects and initiatives thanks to the funding of the European Commission, we have really the opportunity to present a, a big number of practices that demonstrate when, that when technology is used in context, it can have significant results also for the students. And uh, coming to the teacher, the second issue uh, Alan mentioned in his final list, uh, how important it is for us. Um, I would like to say that also this conference is organized in the framework of the closing of a very big initiative, uh, Open Discovery Space, a policy support action that was designed really to demonstrate the bottom-up innovation. So the innovation that is starting in school units is offering the opportunity to teachers to become creators of content because they know very well the needs of their schools, of their classrooms, of their students. So they have the opportunity through a series of, uh, using a series of tools, cooperating and sharing information in an open environment that builds on the expertise from digital schools in Ireland the initiatives uh, coming from uh, UK on how you can introduce innovation in schools, the German and Belgian technology to provide tools, had uh, a great impact in uh, school communities in Balkan countries, because in this project, uh, Croatia, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, and Serbia have uh, performed extremely well, and they have demonstrated that these tools can be used in school environment, helping teachers and the school as an organization to uh, become better and better and implement innovation and uh, activities related to innovation in their settings. So I think this is the Europe we want to cooperate, to exchange uh, best practices in different fields and in the framework of these large-scale initiatives to support teachers to become the really, really the key players of, uh, of innovation. So this is my yeah. first. Uh, Rost, you're, you're, you're basically... Sorry. <laughs> you're basically a teacher. Uh, how is this affecting your uh, practice and actually contributing to innovate your own um, the way that you teach? No, I'm, I'm not a teacher. I train, no, I train teachers. Teacher. Um, I, I have to say that from my background, I have a few inputs to, to what has been said here. I think uh, one thing that I bring back home from this conference is the concept of open. It's very common that we find people saying, oh, no, 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 everything I do is open. It's free. It's on the web. Go there and, and get it, uh, which is not what we call what we should call open. Open means it's here, you can use, and we provide support for you to use it. We know that uh, there are millions or billions of resources on the web. That doesn't mean that uh, a teacher in a small island in the west coast of Africa is going to use it. They don't even know what a website is or if it, it exists somewhere. Open means reach out giving it away and providing your support and sharing. I think that the, the word sharing is very meaningful and we have to embrace the true meaning. Um, I think that uh, what I witnessed in terms of the world of education is kind of a silent earthquake. You know, we build the, the houses and we pretend that we are very solid, protected from everything. 
and we forget that we are earthlings, that earth can take away everything we built in a flash, in a second. And if we don't have each other, if we don't share, if we are not open about what we want to do, then we have nothing. And I think that what's happening to the educational system, as Alan was saying, teachers are spending a lot of time just f to calm down the students and to tell them, look, we need to do this together. 30% of the time of a teacher. If that is only that, I would be surprised. This is telling us that the earthquake is coming. We are not meeting the, the expectations of our client. And our client does not have a nationality. Our client is human beings. And if, if we don't use this opportunity to tell Europe and the world that we need things to be opened and shareable in an easy and effective way, then we are doing everything wrong. And school is going to pay a lot for this. We're going to lose our client. And quality is done by the client. If earthlings don't like what they see, they will move somewhere else. So we need to think about those things. As a teacher trainer, I think I like to listen to the teachers and see what is it that they really need and try to translate the jargon that we have in many of the European good initiatives to something that they really see the value. And they are the clients that are going to bring the world the, the, to move this forward. So I'm very proud to be part of this panel and these initiatives and to have in my hands the opportunity to bring this in the framework of the European Science Education Academy that uh, we announced uh, this week because it's going to be a very important hub for sharing, for openness. Sharing meaning not everything that is out there that is good, but everything that is out there that we find good and that we are capable to support teachers with. So I think this is a new trend in how to do things effectively and collecting uh, a real impact in our clients. Thank you, Rosa. Um, Antonella, you're a researcher. This time I'm right. <laughs> uh, um, what, how can research actually help the teacher community um, in order to do what Rosa has just uh, told us uh, about, uh, allowing them to be more able to choose and to understand that there's a cultural shift more than just having free access to, to tools. In fact, in my view, um, research should be the basis from which to start. And starting from uh, Alan's uh, uh, presentation from this central issue of change, um, what, in my view, we should change uh, is our attitude. Uh, we think we have this uh, um, mandatory uh, mission of integrating technology. We should watch the issue from another perspective. We should think of effective uh, um, teaching and learning uh, activities. Uh, uh, and then, according to this, uh, small research project, I, I would call that research. Um, we should see how technology can help us. You mentioned uh, the um, print invention, which was, of course, revolutionary, and it was technique, it was, uh, you know, something technical, which can be considered revolutionary, as well as uh, computer science and whatever. Um, but more or less around that time, we had the reformation. The reformation was a uh, um, uh, revolution <laughs> because everyone could access education and that was openness, true openness. So technology, but as uh, you were saying, a tool to serve impor important and well thought uh, research uh, design uh, projects where teaching and learning and research are uh, two sides of, of the same coin. Another idea is sharing. And I wish we could start more and more um, sharing activities. Researchers from university and teachers work together, start active uh, projects together, and measure what we collect. In that way, we could have a, a proper use and integration of technology. Uh, 
the last thing I want to say is that, apart from being a researcher uh, at the University of Roma in the Department of Education, I'm also a NAP member. What is NAP in the Eden? This, I think, is important to say here. Network, a network of academics and professionals where we, um, we, we want to, to, to to cooperate with all the, um, the persons, the people interested in um, education, educational projects, technology applied to education. Uh, and so we can help and at the same time cooperate together to start new uh, activities in this sense. So contact us and be uh, part of the NAP uh, area. Thank you, sorry for this, but I think it was useful. Thank you, Antonella. Well, uh, we'll have a second round, uh, but um, at the same time, uh, if you would like to uh, actually ask a question, please just make a sign that I'll give you the floor. Anyway, I would like to ask um, uh, Sophocles now, um, in what way are, uh, do you feel that the schools, uh, which is the work environment in which we um, actually uh, live and the practices are delivered, uh, um, are the schools prepared for this cultural change? What do you think it's needed still? Um, what I can say is uh, the teachers are prepared for this uh, cultural change. The school as organization, as it is heavily affected by the national authorities in most of the countries, uh, has a long way to go, according to my opinion, in most, uh, in most of the countries. Uh, what is really necessary, and I think, uh, Antonio, this was also the message uh, not only of this conference, but also of the previous conference that we have organized in the same setting four uh, years ago, uh, at that time, following the McKinsey report 2011, that was discussing how you can make benefit from a crisis, we had uh, really the opportunity to organize here a conference with the title Never Waste a Crisis. And uh, I would like to remind that there are uh, many opportunities following an economic or a social crisis. And uh, you need really people with vision at uh, the level of uh, the policy making, of course, in order to uh, initiate this open uh, culture to the school as an organization. And I think uh, we are missing that. We are uh, about 10 years after the uh, publication of the um, OECD uh, report on the uh, future schooling. The messages are there, the guidelines, the processes are there, how we can uh, turn our schools to learning organizations, open social centers that uh, where uh, teachers can work really autonomously and they are able to uh, deliver the best uh, uh, learning outcomes. So uh, from my point of view, it's a matter of decisions at policy uh, level in order to give the necessary freedom to the school, to the headmasters, to the leadership of the school, of course with a specific framework, in order to proceed uh, towards this, uh, this direction. Uh, concerning the other parts of, uh, because it's not only, uh, let's say, the school and the headmaster, I think the teachers are demonstrating and we had a unique opportunity. The last three years we have worked with more than 9,000 teachers in the framework of uh, this uh, big initiative in numerous schools in numerous countries. We have seen uh, educational activities designed by them that um, are much more advanced from the existing materials in the school curriculum. So this is the challenge from my point of view. Thank you, Sophocles. Well, uh, since we're running a little bit out of time, um, I would uh, ask a final question to Rosa, uh, which actually leads us back to the to the teacher role. Um, what do we need? Uh, what is needed in terms of teacher training, but also uh, in the um, in the how the, the the school should be reorganized in order to um, um, help to facilitate this cultural change. 
Oh, I think I, uh, I, I was in a conference last week and I heard something that I really liked. Usually, ministers of health don't tell doctors how to, to make a surgery. That would be very wrong. So ministers of education shouldn't be telling teachers how to teach because teachers know what their environment is. So I think autonomy to schools, as Sophocles was saying, autonomy to teachers, and uh, provide them the information, provide them the tools, provide them the training and support they need, and let them be the ones making the choice of what is the best for that particular student. I wouldn't say school or classroom, but student, at the student level. Each of us will need a, a different assistance. So I think the, the what we can do as uh, uh, leaders in, in, in any field of expertise is providing the tools, the necessary tools for the teachers to perform what they already do in an awesome manner. As Sophocles said, we had uh, so many teachers sharing amazing things with us in spite of everything else. Now imagine if those teachers had the necessary tools and support, they would be doing a much better job than what we are seeing nowadays. Thank you, Rosa. Um, please, uh, <laughs> thank you. I hope that you have uh, enjoyed this part of uh, the debate. This is a, com a compliment. We didn't have much time to organize the debate, but this is a, co a compliment to a continuation to the reflection that was uh, first submitted by Alan. And now uh, we're going to the second part of this session. We're running a little bit late, but we'll try to catch up. Uh, and so as I'm uh, as a, any regular teacher, I also should multitask. So now it's my turn to, to deliver the address. So in a Well, um, sorry for the for the delay, but it has also to do with uh, the the external distractions. In this case, the um, the external uh, weather elements. Anyway, um, I'll try to to um, be a little bit shorter in the in the address that I have prepared for you. Uh, actually, the the topic for the for our reflection was exactly this one: opening up the classroom, how inspirational ideas, creative teachers, and innovative tools innovative tools are changing schools or can change schools. Um, I would start by uh, actually going uh, to the to the same topic that has already been addressed during the conference and the, by Alan as well. Uh, this picture uh, can be related to the refugee crisis, as Alan was uh, mentioning, but also to the migrant uh, uh, crisis. And in that sense, there is nothing new, as Alan was uh, uh, mentioning, uh, to Europe. We, we, it's not the first time that we uh, uh, receive refugees. It's not the first time that we have uh, to face uh, um, large migrations. It's not also the first time that um, Europe is also um, uh, producing refugees in the sense and European refugees go to other um, continents. It's not also the first time that migrants go from Europe to other uh, continents as well. And the reasons are the same, being poverty or wars or um, uh, natural disasters. So, what is actually new in this crisis? Probably this new sense of urgency that uh, derives from the notion that interdependence has uh, actually um, came, um, became, became uh, a, a major problem for, for our society. So everything is interdependent and what happens in another place is also affecting our lives. And we have to prepare for it. Of course this has implications in terms of how the school system should, um, should interact and should be prepared to uh, uh, meet this challenge. This was one of the questions actually that was submitted uh, during these um, uh, activities in the social web by, by yourselves and was addressed in, in the conference. So what can we learn from this? Uh, I would suggest that we have basically uh, to learn uh, to apply to education a number of uh, um, uh, conclusions that we can derive from this, um, from this new phenomenon, which is um, the need to apply an holistic approach. This has been a quite uh, an important aspect uh, since the start of this conference. Uh, also the focus on widening participation and outreach. Participation is not just access, it's also a contribution to the knowledge production process. 
focus on cultural transformation, as we just addressed, design more scalable formats, provide, but at the same time also provide more personalized services, uh, be more flexible and adjustable to context, the importance of context is really critical, uh, be more, but also be more rapid in implementing change, and that is also a new thing. Ma at the same time, manage to reduce costs. We all know that uh, public funding has been decreasing all over the world uh, regarding education, and manage to continuously improve quality. Of course, in, in this sense, uh, the use of technology uh, has been quite an important contribution. This, is, of course, is the ODS portal, but it, it's just symbolically representing all the new array of uh, tools that are, have been developed and are available to be used. Be used by the, uh, of course, by teachers, by students, by the families as well. Uh, this refers to the MOOC phenomenon, but uh, which is also uh, uh, an example of how these resources have uh, escalated and are still escalating. However, going back to the OECD report, uh, and not repeating what um, Alan has already uh, um, mentioned, what is important is also to read uh, what the report actually says. And what it says is that it does, it's not that technology um, is disrupting uh, good learning. What it says is that the uh, overuse of technology does not necessarily, at this stage, represent an increase in the learning quality. So in that sense, the conclusion that can be derived from this, because at the same time, if you look at the comparison, and it was done during the conference between the European uh, countries and, for instance, the Far East, uh, the ones in the Far East were uh, uh, using less techn uh, technology in schools or less computer in school, but at the same time, they also show much better um, digital competencies than the European students. So this uh, apparent contradiction, what, show, what shows us is exactly the need to use technology in the best way. And uh, to use technology in the best way is not necessarily to overuse it, is to know how to use it. Um, and that is exactly uh, the conclusion that Andreas Schleicher, um, the Director for Education and Skills of the OECD, um, uh, suggests. That th there is a need to, of course, um, re um, change the, the organizational culture of schools, also uh, teacher uh, training as well. Um, this slide uh, uh, comes, uh, was originally developed for a research workshop on um, directed higher uh, education, but it can be also used in this context. In, that, in essence, what we need to do is to shift our focus from the content to the context. And in that sense, um, these imp the importance of this holistic approach to understand all the, the, the implications of use of technology in um, um, the, the, the educational process, in the learning process. Of course, this has also uh, to do with uh, the practice. And so we have to ever more um, uh, focus on uh, get, uh, going from the use of resources and from the production, the focus on the production of resources, to the support to the development of new innovative practices. And in the case of openness, as I just uh, mentioned before, openness is not just to do with free access to materials, it has to do with a complete new approach to learning, which implies the transparency of the classroom and the ability to uh, let people in you, that let people which out, are out of the classroom to interfere and to contribute to uh, your classroom and at the same time expose your own students and yourself to the, uh, to the surrounding environment. And it is that openness, that, that transparency of the process that actually um, um, is, uh, f that feeds the concept of digital openness. Of course, in this way, uh, scalability as well, uh, because uh, this is, uh, implies, this slide basically uh, implies this uh, or shows this need to change the cultural attitude from a teacher-centered um, uh, process to a more connectivist approach to, to learning as well and to uh, knowledge building. So what we have to do is behind the access to open learning architectures, we have to focus open education in uh, learning, understanding learning as a contextual process which can be built and continuously rebuilt in a shared and inclusive way. In that sense, I would just um, um, retrieve uh, one of the uh, messages that was uh, delivered here at the conference by uh, one of the teachers that was awarded on Saturday, Nectarius Tsagiotis, uh, which is quite inspirational. 
And this means exactly um, the, the represents at, uh, at the best what is this concept of openness. So it's actually not necessarily to bring the, uh, the world to the classroom, but it's to rebuild the classroom in, your, in the uh, actual um, uh, work environment, daily uh, uh, work daily environment, and our own um, uh, in the world, actually. And this is quite inspirational and represents what should be the attitude of these uh, teachers. Nectarius, as most of you are basically change agents, you are actually producing change and innovating the practices, but also by that innovating uh, you, um, the, your schools and actually bringing change to your um, organizations, your schools and to your environments and to your communities. As this slide basically shows, that the basic principles of education can apply being used in a traditional model or in the flip model. What is important here is what you want to achieve and so how those practices are structured. But as we don't have much time, let me just uh, get you to this, uh, lead you to the second part of the presentation, which was exactly how can an organization as Eden um, contribute to that change and support the, com the teacher's community. First of all, let, let me just introduce Eden as we see it. Eden is the largest network of uh, open distance and learning in Europe, and we see ourselves not just as a large network of institutions, but also of academics and practitioners, but also, uh, and most importantly, as a crossroad of ideas and experiences that are diversified, um, and also a community's legacy, and that is something that is important to understand uh, when we are addressing this cultural change. In that sense, the Open Classroom Initiative, which is now uh, um, uh, completing 20 years, and you can see here in the, in the slide the different titles of the different uh, conferences, starting by the last one in the, in, the, uh, in the lower part of the slide to the top one, you see that uh, this is something that has been a discussion amongst us for, uh, for 20 years. All of these uh, the transformation process, all the concepts that are implied, and also the, the sharing of the practices and the examples. But how can these affect you and how can these be useful or even more useful to you? And in that sense, this is how we um, perceive that our contribution as a network can be to help uh, sustain this change. How, how does it contribute and can contribute to the innovation in schools? First of all, of course, by, uh, as um, um, Sophocles mentioned in his um, comment as well, by lobbying for and supporting the emergence of favorable regulatory frameworks, but also policies and funding. Secondly, by disseminating the European legacy of expertise. This is, uh, innovation in schools is just a part of a broader picture in which a, a, a community of thousands of uh, teachers of different uh, school, uh, different educational levels are doing uh, similar things. And we need, need to uh, actually share those experiences and learn from each other. And uh, uh, apart from that, there is also the output of research. And there's a, a strong tradition of research in Europe in this field. So how can we uh, actually, uh, this uh, for, creates a legacy of expertise that we need to take advantage of. Also by uh, our contribution uh, is also um, structured in providing networking opportunities, as this conference is an example. Also by providing training and certification of competencies. And uh, that is something that will be uh, further uh, developing in the coming years, especially with the um, emergence of the Eden Academy initiatives. Also by helping to bridge between research and practice, as I've mentioned, by showcasing the best European practices worldwide, not just in Europe, but also uh, learning from the communities in other continents and other regions as well, by recognizing the work of the change agencies, yourselves, and by inviting you all to be part of the largest European community of experts and practitioners in open and digital education. The message here is that each one of you is not alone. It's part of a community and we can, of course, uh, facilitate that integration. In that sense, um, this is more or less the key words are represented here. And so we do hope that uh, we can contribute to, um, to your work. And in that sense, we are open as well, we should be, open to 
not only to your contribution, but also to your ideas, your suggestions, and your comments. So um, I hope this will uh, be kind of an um, uh, inter interesting introduction to the ones who don't know Eden, the others who already know it, and are part of it. Uh, well, uh, this is just a, um, a continuation of what has been already uh, discussed before in previous conference, but I do hope that uh, we can help you uh, much more in the future. Thank you very much. Now, continuing your multitasking. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, just a, a short, uh, we're running a little bit late, but not too late still. Um, just a, a short uh, introduction to this new concept uh, that relates to this um, awarding uh, aspect that I was just mentioning. This is the first conference, this one, the open classroom here. Uh, this will be the first conference in uh, Eden's history in which we'll be offering Eden Open Badges. What does it mean? It means that you, all of you, will be receiving by email. You don't need to, uh, uh, to do anything at this stage. You'll be receiving, you'll be receiving by email um, these uh, badges. These badges are basically digital, um, um, digital uh, artifacts in the sense that represent the um, certification of a specific contest. In this case, uh, we are offering two badges for the ones who spoke at the conference and the ones who participate. Well, several have uh, accumulated both roles. But anyway, this is just uh, the start of this new schema. Uh, this works as a typical open badge. Uh, most of you uh, are already familiar with the concept. Others will be, become more familiar in the, in the afternoon. There is a, a workshop specifically dedicated to this. And our idea is to enlarge, to widen uh, these number of badges in the future by uh, awarding them also to specific competencies that are not just the typical participation and uh, speaking at the, at the conference, but also um, uh, the, the how have you contributed to the social media activity around the conference and things like that. So these are uh, different competencies that should be awarded in the, in the framework of a conference, in the world uh, in the framework of a conference in, in, uh, conceived as a learning experience and that we um, uh, certify and, and that you can use it to build your own uh, e-portfolio. So this is the, the presentation of these open badges. Uh, you'll be receiving them uh, later on after the conference in your emails. And now continuing to the, uh, about uh, this awarding policy of Eden, as you know, we have a, a number of um, awards that we uh, hand over uh, during our conferences, but we are now also inaugurating another one, which is the Best Practice Initiative Award uh, that we'll be handing over for the first time uh, here at the Open Classroom as well. So Ildiko will be, uh, Ildiko Baza, can you please? You already know her for, for, well, from the conference. Uh, she's the Deputy Secretary General of Eden, and she'll be reading the laudation of uh, this uh, Best Practice Award. Thank you. And so the Eden Best Practice Initiative Award is given to the presentation titled Implementing Innovative <laughs> and Drums, Implementing Innovative Learning Methods, a Two Schools Example. The authors we are recognizing here are Maria Argiropoulou from the Fourth General High School of Patras, Ioannis Chotelis, who's sitting amongst us, and I would kindly invite him to receive the uh, <laughs> award, from Experimental High School of University of Patras. And two other co-authors are Maria Teodoropoulou and George Birvas from General High School of Palopio, Greece. And now the laudation. The well-elaborated paper has positioned properly the important issue of school modernization. In the introduction chapter, the paper is highlighting relevant points of the conceptual environment. The good selection of the two institutions compared plays important role and has proven to be relevant basis of the activities. The activities have been integrated in a wider strategic institutional development program, knowledge management, of the schools. The ICT tools were selected and used properly and in a professional, modern way, exploiting their best potentials. Several digital and online cooperative events have been rightly selected and carried out in different complex themes. The activities produced valuable and sustainable activities amongst the students and mobilized self-generated activities of their communities. 
the project was accompanied by appropriate evaluation. The findings of the initiative are not only interesting and carry pedagogical research value, but also serve as good example to launch and implement good practice of ICT enhanced collaborative learning and institutional cooperation with long-term impact. Thank you very much, congratulations. So, and that's it. Uh, with the 15 minutes delay, sorry for this, uh, now there will be a, a, new a new session. We'll be uh, completing this one, and, and we'll, there will be a new session that will be presented by uh, Sophocles. And so please, uh, once again, uh, 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 please accompany me in a handover to the, the panel. Thank you.